Uh, I thank God for this morning as we get to celebrate the Lord today and not celebrate darkness because there's no celebration in darkness um, that is fruitful. Um, so I thank God this morning. And so with that, let's get into the message. And I want to take us all back to a time when we first come into this world and just think about that baby, when the baby comes into the world, leaving a safe, secure environment and right in that um, operating room comes in to all this chaos. And you can imagine the cortisol level is really up and the baby's anxious and, and frightful. And immediately, many of you know that have experienced uh, this um, birth, uh, wonder of birth, you know that immediately they take the baby and put the baby right on the mother. And there's a reason they do that is because, because of the anxiety and stress and trauma of that child coming into this world, they know that putting the baby on the mom will give immediate soothing and relief and to reduce the cortisol level, to reduce the heart rate, all of that, because the baby will be on the mother's skin and hear the heartbeat that it's been used to hearing for you know 36, 46 weeks of development. And it brings a calming. So this power of touch. And I wanted to talk about that today because it's really important, especially as we're still enduring uh, this social distancing and social isolation for many uh, that are not able to see and touch one another. It's really a serious thing because we were not designed to be alone or not to have some sort of touch. And even from the very beginning in life, touch is so important. So again, just think about that, the stress, the trauma, but how it's all calmed down. And then this release of oxytocin happens, this soothing calms the baby right down to really start decreasing those levels of cortisol. And then also heart rate begins to come down as well. So this power um, and touch, but this is the first language that we learned, this power of touch from a Dr. Tiffany Field, some research I was looking at, touch is the first and perhaps the most profound language that we learn when we're very young. Touch might have more immediate impact than words because it's physical and it leads to a chain of that bioelectric and chemical changes that basically relax the nervous system, which is what I've just described to you. And so think about that and let that sit as a foundation for today, that when you have touch from someone that you love, someone you have a relationship with, it has this common effect and it certainly has a physiological reaction even within us to help us be better. And so when we talk about being a community of wellness, when you see community gatherings, people are hugging, they're touching, they're laughing, all of that is releasing these wonderful chemicals that make us feel satisfied and connected and in a place of belonging. That's why touch is so important. So not only when you first get born, but as the education and early learning happens for a child, the power of touch is very important in the early years with regards to even helping a child feel secure as they grow into their identity. But those early years are so important. So again, what you do in the early years is so important and really sets the course for the rest of the lo your lives. So as we think about being globally minded as well, because God wants us to think about the globe, amen. And so we think about where we are right now, there's civil unrest in the US that's based on a lot of different things. And there's this economic shock of a pandemic. And we, many of us haven't even seen that. But if you actually live in a higher economic level, you've already seen the impact economically. If you were a family business owner of a restaurant, you've seen the economic impact. We've seen, and when you look at uh, families that we work with within Healthy Start, those that live in poverty, many have lost their homes and they've become homeless. Many that are food challenged have not eaten. And we know that violence has increased because people are just stressed out. And so this is a crazy impact. And as we look around the world globally, the stories that are in the news of what's happening as an impact of this pandemic economically, where again, it's about food and people are desperate and robbing is happening. And then the word that's been out there is tender box. There's a tender box. Well, that tender box is just a small little box that has uh, and things in it that can help start a fire. So there are things that are about to be set off because of this pandemic that we haven't even seen yet. And that's why we need to be in a place of prayer for this nation and for this world. And people are describing this as a perfect storm, right? You have a, a pandemic, you have economic impact, and you have civil unrest that's happening all over the world. And then there are many of those highest risk countries, which you see here. So you can really see there's going to be this domino effect or impact of this pandemic. And so 
really be mindful that not only God concerned about us as individuals, he's really concerned about our families, our communities, this nation and the globe. So Father, we pray, have your way today. Prayer has already gone forth, oh God, but we pray that our ears are attentive to what your spirit would say to us today. In Jesus name, amen. So we're looking globally and God wants us to look at our world is getting desperate. So as I've described some things, people are moving to a place of desperation and they don't know what to do because the longer this goes on, what am I going to do? And that is why we said at the beginning of this, how important it is to share the gospel, to share Jesus with everyone around you. And so the subject today is a faith that pursues God. And I pray that we have strong faith, a faith that pursues God, a faith that is not dormant, a faith that is not lazy, but really an active pursuit of God, because God loves it when we pursue him and when our faith causes us to do that pursuit. And so learning how to come to Christ with our desperate need, and when you find yourself in a desperate place, come to Christ, and I know that he will touch you. So that is a subject, a faith that pursues God and really looking at coming to Christ with our desperate need. And I want to read this quote by Charles Spurgeon, and this goes to our fingerprint this morning. So again, thank you, Sister Tanya. But he says, our thanks are due to God for all temporal blessings. They are more than we deserve. But our thanks ought to go to God in thunders of hallelujahs for spiritual blessings. And co-pastor was expounding. We have so many spiritual blessings that we should be shouting hallelujah and praise to God all the time. It says a new heart is better than a new coat. How many have had a changed heart? That is better than a new coat. He says to feed on Christ is better than to have the best healthy food. To be an heir of God is better than being an heir of the greatest nobleman. To have God for our portion is blessed. And you ever heard someone say, he is my portion. I don't care whatever you want, uh, else you have to give. The Lord is my portion. And we're blessed with that. Infinitely more blessed than to own broad acres of land. God has blessed us with spiritual blessings. These are the rarest, the richest, the most enduring of all blessings, and they are priceless in value. This stuck out for me this week because of the meditation in Ephesians, the first chapter. In verse three, it says of Ephesians one, all praise to God, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly realms because we are united in Christ. And so praise to God. And I love the worship song today. Hallelujah to God. Are you grateful today knowing that God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing? He has not withheld anything from us. He gave us all his only begotten son spiritual blessings that are secured in a heavenly realm. Like I always tell folks, I said, I don't put too much faith in my car or my job or whatever, because these are things that can be taken from us at any time. You could get sick and not be able to work. You could lose your job and not be able to pay your car note and somebody is coming to get the car. But these blessings are secured in a heavenly realm. So nobody's coming to take the blessings that God has given us. And it is because we have unity with Christ. And I thank Christ, thank God that Jesus is in our lives and we have union with him and therefore union with the Father. Just that alone is enough to wake up and really thank God for all day long. Thank you that my name is written in the book of heaven. Thank you that you are concerned and your blessings are upon me when I walk out of my house. Thank you that I have access to the throne anytime I need. It is a wonderful blessing. And as Sister Tanya said, one that we should not take for granted. And verse five says, God decided in advance. So before we were born, there's nothing that you and I did. This is all decided way before. He decided to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. There was no way for us to get to God. There was absolutely no way. There are other religions that try to teach us how to get to God, but there's no other way man can come to God but by Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ. So God has brought us to himself through Jesus Christ. And that's what he wanted to do. He wanted the Fellowship. He wanted us with them. He didn't want us lost. He doesn't want you out there suffering by yourself. It gave him great pleasure to even offer Jesus as a sacrifice. That is beautiful. 
That is beautiful, the extent in which he loved us and the extent to which he went to bring us to himself. I love when Paul was talking here, verse six. So we praise God, again, back to this praising of God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us. Now think of that, pouring out on us, this overwhelming grace, God's divine ability in us. And I don't know about you, but since I've been saved, there are so many things that I don't, I feel I cannot do. I didn't know that I could do certain things, but God's grace has been sufficient. Things that I thought I could not go through, did not want to go through, but God's grace was there. So he poured out this grace in abundance because we belong to him. Verse seven, he is so rich in kindness and grace. And you know kind people, but there's no kindness like God's kindness. Have you really received this reality that God has just kind us because he loves us so much? It's not for anything we've done, but he just loves us and he's just kind to us. No judgment doesn't go up and down with us. He's kind in his grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of Jesus. Don't knowing that Jesus gave his life, his blood was shed, that we can be redeemed back to God. Our sins are forgiven. In verse 8, he then showered with this kindness. So this grace, this kindness is just like a flood over us. And when you pause and think about it, it is a wonderful reality to have and understanding that God's grace is upon me. I can't lose with this. I won't go under. I shall live and not die. His kindness is there for me. And that comes with wisdom and understanding. And so Paul wants us to focus on the blessings that we have. He wants us to focus on the identity. And I know two weeks ago, Colton went into, you have to know your identity in Christ. Without that, you'll be lost. You'll be drifted. You'll be disconnected. You won't know where you belong. But our identity through Christ. And then also this covering grace. And when you realize that, it's like, wow, what can come against me, right? What can, how should we respond to blessings, identity, to this grace? There's no power stronger than having the power of God in our lives. And we get to verse 13, he says, and now you Gentiles, people that were excluded are now included. And really understand an inclusion. Now, I don't know if you've ever been excluded for some, from something you know, segregated from something, but God has called us all the way into full inclusion. That So you receive the truth, this good news that God saves us. And people need to know God can save you from whatever. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you his Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. The Spirit of God lives inside of us. None of us would have come to God unless the Spirit had drawn us. So God saved us. You are here today because the spirit has draw, drew you one day and certainly gives you a desire to be here even today. The spirit of God is alive and living in us. And verse 15 says, ever since I first heard of your strong faith, back to faith, because that's what I'm on. I thank God for faith. I don't take it for granted that I love God so much. I thank him for his spirit that causes me to yearn for him even more. I thank God that he has grown my faith and he continues strengthen my faith, God. Thank you. Paul says, your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for God's people. Because when you have strong faith, and like our sister said, it's not just to be blessed for yourself, but now now I want to be a blessing to other people everywhere. I have a, a burden in my soul, not just for myself or my immediate family, but I do have a burden for my community. As a shepherd, I want everyone here to be blessed. I want families to be blessed. I want men and women of God to be blessed. I want the nation to be blessed. I want the world to be blessed as God intended. So this love that we have for everyone, the entire world. In 19, I also pray that you will understand incredible greatness of God's power. And that's something else to meditate on. We'll learn about God's power, this mighty power that God allows us to tap into. It's incredible. And when you understand that you can move your life forward, we don't have time to stay on stuck. We need to advance. We can't be overwhelmed by the last few months. We must really mount up our strength and continue to move forward with this power inside. And so salvation is something to focus on. 
faith is something to focus on and power, salvation, faith, power, expansive blessings. They go beyond the earthly realm. They're deeper when you understand the blessings of God, having a sound mind. And I don't know if you've ever been sad, depressed, or have anxiety when the peace of God comes and settles that, that is deep. And people don't understand why you have a sound mind, but you've been delivered from childhood trauma. God comes and does something internally. No one can see that, but boy, is that a wonderful blessing to be delivered from low self-esteem. And it's bountiful. There's just no end to the blessings of God. The more you know him, the more you grow in him, the more you begin to experience, my God, this is what's your blessing. And when you find yourself in service to God, it is bountiful, the things and the satisfaction you will have. And then it's just extensive. It continues to extend. Desperate for God. So let's look at the story of the woman with the issue, right? That day she knew the Messiah was passing by in Mark 5. She was in the crowd that says she suffered 12 years of this constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors, suffered from doctors. So we go through that now, right? People don't treat you right. It's hard to get medical care. It is hard, but she suffered from many doctors. And over the years, she spent everything she had to pay for them. So now she's poor, but she had gotten no better. And sometimes you try everything and you don't get any better. In fact, she had gotten worse, the Bible says here. She had heard about Jesus. And so she came up behind him through the crowd and she touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Immediately the bleeding stopped and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of a terrible condition. And we read in another version, which we'll get to in a moment, but she, in this, in Mark's version in, of the story, in her body, she felt she was healed from the terrible condition. And it was signified because the bleeding stopped. After 12 years, the bleeding stopped. She touched his, she felt healing in her body immediately. And I wrote that there Leviticus, so you can look at the, the law that said when you're bleeding, she was considered to be unclean. She shouldn't have been nowhere near anybody, never mind touching somebody's robe. She shouldn't have even been near people. She should have been isolated. She didn't have a right to touch a soul. The woman took every opportunity to make her way close enough to him, though so that she can touch the hem of his garment. She came to him in such a manner, why? To conceal herself that no one noticed who, who she is because she knew that if they knew that she was the unclean woman, that she could be killed just for that. It's a crime to be touching people and being around folks when you're unclean. So why did she do this? We know she was desperate. When we get desperate, we'll do almost anything. But her desperation just wasn't desperation to thin air. She heard about Jesus and she knew he was a healer. And she just said, if I can just touch the hem. So why did she do this? She wanted, it was her last hope. She was desperate. So what do we do in desperation? This is a woman that was in desperation and she reached out and touched his hem of his garment is what she did out of desperation. And I don't know where you are today, what you may be going through, but sometimes you have to take a chance and just reach out. You hear this word, I'm telling you to try the word, it is true. There are many people around that'll say, his word is true, have faith in God's word. So she touched him. Again, she considered unclean for 12 years. Imagine having, usually the first a woman's regular cycle, it's seven days, right? And then if it's prolonged, it's longer. But here it is 12 years that she's been separated, isolated, unable to touch people. Can you imagine the implications of 12 years of isolation? She was not meant to touch anyone. If she was married, she couldn't touch her husband because she couldn't be near him. If she had children or family or friends, she couldn't touch them and be near them either. She wouldn't even be able to be in her house to cook or clean or care for her own family. Can you imagine those simple things being taken away from you, not being able to touch folks? She had to be isolated because of her impurity. And there are many things that keeps us isolated and separated. Sin does that. But you got to get desperate. You got to be desperate and want more. She heard about him coming to town and there was an opportunity. That was her last hope. She couldn't reveal herself for people to know it was a serious crime. She took this big risk, right, for healing just to touch the hem of his garment. What did she know that gave her such an assurance that if this is really the Messiah, that she would receive healing by touching his garment? 
So she knew her word. So sometimes you just need a word. You don't need to know all of it, but just a word. And, and she must have known Malachi 4 and 2, but unto you that fear my name, that shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And the word for wings is the same word they use for corners of a garment. So it closes with this prophecy that references the corner of the garment, because the corner of a Jewish man's garment in ancient Israel was very important because it was about identity. When you looked at the tassels on the garment, it showed you the identity, where people belong. Then so Jesus' identity, at the heart of his identity, is healing. Jesus is our healer, Jehovah Rapha. So he will heal us spiritually and eventually physical for all those who trusted him. So that was part of his identity. She knew that Jesus was a healer. That's who he is. That's his identity. That's what the prophecy was about him, that he will heal. And she reached out and just touched the corners of his garment. She was healed by his wings. And I like it in Luke, right? It says, a woman in a crowd suffered for these 12 years, constant bleeding with no cure. Coming up behind you, she touched the fringe, the edges, the wings, the edges. Immediately the blood stopped. Who touched me? Ah, I love this, right? Because she touched him. And he says, who touched me? Jesus asked. Everyone denied it. And Peter said, master, this whole crowd is pressing against you. Oh, we live in a time now where people would press to God right now. Press in. I mean, really press into Jesus. People just, and sometimes you think they're just going through the motions. But what is it to really press into Christ? To want to touch him? To be desperate and say, my life is at a place where I need you. Just let me get to him. We don't have that desperation around us. But I pray that people will become desperate enough. But Jesus says, someone deliberately touched me, for I felt the healing power go from me. And I like this because the woman experienced the healing power flowing from here. And here is Jesus saying, I felt some healing power, leave me and go. And when the woman realized that she could not stay hidden, she began to tremble because she knew she shouldn't have been there. She fell to her knees in front of him, probably ready to say, forgive me, I beg for mercy. The whole crowd heard her explain why she touched him and that she had been immediately healed. And he said to her daughter, your faith has made you well. Faith and wellness. There's a conversation there, people of God. Faith and wellness. And we need to expound on the wellness that Jesus gives. And it's like a ripple effect. I talked about the ripple effect last week. When Jesus does something for us, it's not just for that piece of thing we need, but you'll find that there's this rippling effect of the healing of Jesus, this ripple effect of the peace that he gives us. Because we have peace, my family experiences a peaceful man. Not only my family experiences a peaceful man, but I'm able to perform on the job because God has given me a sound mind. You need to understand wellness. He's concerned about us spiritually, physically, mentally, every level he's concerned about. And when Jesus healed, he was concerned always about wholeness or complete. We're talking about wellness. This woman had been disconnected from her family. This woman had been disconnected from community. She was not alive. She didn't feel comforted. She didn't feel like she belonged. She wasn't having any experience of people holding her where she was able to release oxytocin and be felt comforted. She was out there for 12 years. And Jesus knew that. And he says, your faith has made you well, because the son of the living God was there, right? And dwelling in him is all the power that you and I need to move forward. So one touch is all you need from Jesus. And I love it because he touches us as well. And that song, um, He Touched Me by Bill Gaither in the 70s. And the powerful verse I love, he touched me. Oh, how he touched me. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. If you've ever been touched by the Lord in a way when God really rescued and delivered you, oh my goodness, something happened. And now I know that he touched me and he made me whole. That should be a testimony of everybody on this call that knows Jesus' touch. And I know his touch when he lifts us out of the Martin clay, when he delivers our mind from confusion and depression. It makes you want to shout hallelujah and thank you, Jesus, for saving me, for delivering my mind. Thank you for keeping me when I didn't want to be kept. Thank you for touching me. The power of touch. 
in Romania, the president years ago decided that no one should um, get rid of any children and have more children. Here, all these children, so many children were born and they were born and couldn't be cared for. They couldn't be touched and they had to be um, raised in institutions. And it was found out that they had this severe sensory deprivation because no one was touching them. I want to talk about the power of touch just for a few moments. The mother's touch can set the tone for one's life. And look at us. How many of you were really touched and handled by your mama? You can tell who's been really touched. Those that feel loving, it's because they had a loving touch of a mother. And those attachments in the early years are so important. Talking about the power of touch. When your child runs to you and they're afraid or they're going through bullying or what have you, this power of touch can reduce their stress, their heart rate, and their blood pressure, because even children go through stress at school and dealing with other people, but a hug can make a big difference. The power of touch, when we work with fathers, we talk about skin to skin and putting the baby right on your, your skin as a father. Why? Because there's connecting that can happen. There's bonding and there's securing. When you touch, hallelujah, there's power that goes through even in the body and more on the skin to skin. It also regulates heartbeats. It soothes the baby. It relaxes and calms him. And that's why we tell fathers, you can get in on the act too. It's not just about mother in the early days. Lie that child on your chest so you can regulate their heartbeat. They can, you can, your heart will help regulate their heartbeat. Your rhythm and your body will be picked up by theirs. And I'm telling you, the power of God in the creation of these bodies, something wonderful happens even before the baby starts talking to you. There's power of touch. And when you're bathing your child, and you ever wonder why the the baby feels so great that you're playing with them in the tub. They're just splashing them. They're just sponging them. That you're playing rain on their head and you're soaping them up and you're drying them and you're touching them. What's going on here? There's happiness going on with the child. And even for the mother or father, you can feel it too. There's joy. There's something that relaxes the baby. That's why a bath before bedtime works wonders. It causes that the dopamine to go and the child begins to relax. They feel comforted and secured. There's the power of touch where the child knows I am cared for. Jesus will let you know that you are cared for. You must know that I am loved of God. And also you feel I'm special when somebody touches you. If you're afraid you get hurt, you can run to the mother's arms and everything will be okay. It builds trust. And that's why we need to know, touch me, Jesus. I want my trust to grow in you. How the power of touch. I remember when we were able to visit, we were able to go to the a uh, nursing home, but that's something that's on my heart, a burden that we can't be with those people because just touching them made a difference. We know it makes a difference for infants when you come into the world, but as you're coming older and going out of the world, we need to know to touch loved ones, our elders. Just sometimes just putting your hand on someone's shoulders makes a difference. Grabbing their hands and feeling that power of touch is important. There are healing virtues. Hallelujah. Reminder that someone matters. The woman knew power of touch. Are you ready? Are you desperate enough for touch? Do you want to touch the Lord? Or you want healing in your life? Do you want to be well? Are you desperate enough? Are you desperate enough to get close to Jesus today? And remember from the fifth chapter of Ephesians, you got to be careful how you live. Be committed to him. Walk by faith, not by sight. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Learn how to tap into this power that lives on the inside, you all. Let's not just fade out, but let's pump it up and move forward. Tap into the power for your life. Recognize our condition without him and strive and long for him even more. Jesus responds to faith and he responded to the faith of this woman. This is Dr. Mira. I've been following him for years, a clinician, but he has a wonderful personal story. But at one point, he almost lost his eyesight. And he's known for talking about cultural stress. We allow everything around us to wear us out. It's just part of living in the 21st century. But you have to let go, and you have to get live a connected life. You have to make sure if you're saved, then live saved. If you're a child of light, then walk in the light and live a connected life, which is what he talks about. And at one point, when he had his challenge with his eyes, where he couldn't see for a while. He started something new. He discovered other things about himself. Don't be limited. Know your identity. Know all those wonderful things God has placed in you and let them come forth. Let them come alive. No matter how old you are, he says, you have an opportunity to make changes in your life to make you as happy as possible. And God is saying that to somebody today. 
Who are you at your core? There's so many things in us. And you know, you can do it all. If God has given it to you and he wants it for his kingdom, then you can do it all. It is possible with God. This is a man that came here with nothing to this country from Iran and Iraq rather, came here with nothing. All, he's 81 years old today. And he does all of these things, but he doesn't forget his family and he stays connected spiritually. The best thing he said, he's a dermatologist. He's the best thing you can do is for your skin is smile. And I say, I'm saying this because every day, you know, our skin, millions of cells renew themselves every day. So you think about God renewing us every day. So much is going, but our skin is renewing itself every day. Spending time with family, touching and hugging. There's a renewal that happens every day that God wants you to experience. So you have to go ahead and get desperate in touch. This wellness is about restoration. See, God, Jesus knew it's about, let me restore this woman and the relationships around her. Most likely her countenance, her behavior changed after she was healed because you recognize that he restored relationships. So she was married, that first realm, that she's able to be with the person who loves her. A good close friend of mine is, is stuck in California on the other side of the nation. Her husband and children are on the East Coast. She hasn't seen them in seven months. Her 45th wedding anniversary happened. She did not see her husband. She has not been touched by the one who loves her. She has a new grandbaby born a couple of months ago, has not been able to see and physically but no touch. And she, she and I talk, she's missing being hugged by her husband, touched by her husband, holding his hand. Those simple things that sister times that we used to take for granted had become really important during this time, the power of touch. But this woman, perhaps she was restored back to her, her spouse. And not only that, she got reconnected to her children, her family. And then God will recreate and, and, and restore your connection to community. So again, what he does for us, it's for our family, it's for our community, you all. I hope that you think about hugging a little more during these days, because it's a practical piece to this message. This gospel is for the world, people of God. We have a global challenge happening right here. This pandemic is not just about U.S., it's not just about you and me. It's a global challenge right now. And we're in the danger of the deprivation of touch. People are not being able to see each other, not being able to operate as human beings, which is what God, there's a, there's something happens when we're not touching. I mean, the, again, the chemicals in the body are shifting, which does impact how people think. And therefore, spiritually, it is a problem not being able to touch. So when you hug folks, you know there's a higher premium on that hug now. Touching someone's hand, there's a higher premium. I appreciate my family being around me that I can hug and touch. There are times when I jump up and just go and hug and touch because there's a high value on it right now to help with my mental state. Are you hearing me, people of God? God made this, made our bodies, not us. And we need the touch. But what happens when people aren't being touched? Babies aren't being picked up. What happens? Social isolation and distance. That's a problem. You should be praying for that. But this salvation is for everyone, and we need to get this gospel out. So I hope that you're inspired to do so, because as we continue, the world is coming to desperate times. And the question is, are you desperate enough to seek for the Lord? And I close with Matthew 9 and 35. We need workers, you all. Jesus traveled to all the towns and villages in that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. Are you a carrier of the message, the good news about Jesus?